These are short teachings, sharings, or even testimonies that are designed to either inform or to inspire or just to get you to think about something. And I have two teachings that I want to do on the topic of unity. And this first one is the foundation of unity. And I pray it will get you to think about what unity might mean and what it might look like in the body of Christ. And we start with the foundation of unity, which is going to be a little different than what you might anticipate. Now, unity is a big topic today. And the reason it's a big topic is because there's so little of it. No matter where you look, whether in our country, around the world at large, and sadly, also within the Christian church. But there is a solution to this lack of unity within the church. And if we find that solution, then it will go a long way toward allowing us to influence our country, the world, and our culture in a great and wonderful way. So let's ask a question. What is unity among Christians? And I suppose that one word you could use to describe Christian unity would be non-existent. Let me tell you something about that. Depending on how you look at the church today, there are about 200 what you might call different streams of Christianity. And within those broad categories, there are probably 30,000 different groups that are different enough from each other to be considered separate denominations. And over the past year, many of these churches have not only introduced doctrinal ideas into their division, but they've also introduced politics, and that sort of multiplies it even more. And nobody thinks that this is a good idea, but people simply do not have an understanding at how to approach achieving what they all feel is a good idea, which is unity. And this is where we need to start changing our focus. When you think about unity, you don't want to think about organizations. If we want to think of unity, we need to think of unity among individual Christians. Unity doesn't happen between organizations. It happens with people, with individual Christian men and women. And unity, by the way, is not going to be based on a full agreement about everything that the Bible says. It's just not going to happen today. If that was the requirement for Christian unity, we would not have 30,000 denominations. We would have like 1.2 billion denominations, as everybody has slightly different views of Scripture. Fortunately, that is not what is required to enjoy Christian unity. The foundation of unity within the body of Christ is very different than what most people imagine. It doesn't start, by the way, with statements of belief. It starts with our common heritage as children of God. In Galatians chapter 3, in verse 26, it says, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. No matter what stream of Christianity you might come from, you are a child of God. And that connects us in a way far beyond organizations. Our common heritage gives us a starting point for unity. We have been given unity as a start by virtue of the new birth. Our responsibility isn't to seek out and achieve unity. Our challenge our encouragement, our charge from God is to preserve what God has so freely given us. And for that, we're going to look at the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 starts what is often called the practical side of the book of Ephesians. The first three chapters deal with the truth of the great mystery of the church, which is Jew and Gentile being fellow heirs. And starting in chapter 4, we get into the, what that means in the real world. And the first thing that God brings up is unity. And we, he introduces it in an unusual way. Ephesians 4.1 says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord. Paul was in prison in Rome when he wrote this. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, this verse contains several great and wonderful truths that are either unknown 
or often ignored. Unity is not based on opinions and beliefs. As I said before, unity is based on our common heritage as children of God. We have been given unity on the most fundamental level in the new birth. But how do we maintain and guard that? What do we do moving forward? Well, these first couple of verses in Ephesians 4 give us the attitudes, the heart that we are to have as we pursue unity within the body of Christ. Before you ever get to any items that God might want you to agree on from the Bible, he encourages us and shows us that the key to maintaining unity within the church is to be humble, to be patient, to be gentle, to be tolerant, and to love one another. Now, to be humble, humility is the opposite of pride. And it means you don't insist on your own way. And also, it means you don't look down on others who are of a different persuasion than you. To be gentle, that's a wonderful one. We need a bit more gentleness in our society today. To be gentle means that you show kindness and consideration for others. Patience means that we stick with each other through the easy times, through the difficult times. And when you get to the word tolerant or to be tolerant, or to bear with one another, there's a Greek word behind that, which is very interesting. The most comprehensive dictionary to the Greek New Testament describes tolerance as the quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. And if we can achieve that, then we will be quite tolerant of one another. And of course, the final exhortation is the same as God's first exhortation several places in the Bible, and that is to love one another. And to love someone means that we value them. It means that we care for them. And all this comes, all these things come before we even get to one item of belief. We don't have a statement of beliefs from God yet. Nothing going. The church is called, among many other things, it's called the body of Christ. And when a human body is working properly, it grows. The same is true for the body of Christ. And we see this here in Ephesians 4, a few verses later in verse 16. It says, from Christ, the whole body, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Jesus Christ is moving to allow the body to grow and build itself up in love. But it has to be working properly to do that. And that means we as Christian men and women, among other things, need to seek to maintain the unity of the Spirit that we've been given. Unity helps the church grow and mature. Discord stunts our growth. In fact, it is even worse than stunting our growth. What discord does is it introduces an autoimmune disease into the body of Christ. You know what an autoimmune disease is? And in autoimmune disease, your immune system, which was designed by God, mistakes a part of your own body, like perhaps your joints or your skin, and it identifies it as foreign. Your body then sets about attacking itself. Now, in case you were wondering, that is not a good thing. The church is the body of Christ, and when it lacks unity, the result is rather than maturing and growing in love, The body is consumed, suffering multiple attacks of an autoimmune disease that is just damaging lives, damaging ministries, and eating the church away at the core. And not only that, it is sadly keeping us from our true mission, which is to reach men and women for Christ. We're going to look at Philippians because Philippians gives us further insight into how to maintain the unity we have been given in the Spirit. As in Ephesians, we're not going to read anything specific that we are to believe together. We're not going to see that yet. Philippians 2.1 says, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete. How could you make Paul's joy complete? By being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. How are we going to do that? Well, let's keep reading. Look at verse 3. It says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, 
but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Humility was one of the chief characteristics of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was born a king. He lived as a servant. He died as a criminal. That was our Lord and Savior, and he did that all for us. Jesus lived these verses in Philippians. We can do the same. Again, notice we have not yet been given anything specific to agree upon. We don't have anything for our statement of beliefs yet, but we have a lot of encouragement about the love of God. Unity first requires a solid foundation of humility and unselfish heart and lots of love. And we need to recognize that it is based on our common heritage as sons and daughters of God. If we keep these matters in focus, then we can move on to the truths in God's Word and sort out how we might maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace in what we believe. And that's where we're going to be going next when we consider some various key truths that God considers important for us to rally around as the body of Christ.